Okay. Um, still having issues with network sometime. Let me check my audio real quickly here. Um, test. All right. So I think as I was saying here, the um, um, a, a good approach to this is, you know, if, if we're talking about whether some mechanism um, prevents deadlocks or not, you should look at uh, the, the four necessary sufficient conditions, okay? So th this example, as I discussed here, uh, the, the mechanism, you know, and again, most people just weren't actually dealing with, weren't discussing um, the mechanism that was given here. So the mechanism is that if you pick up the, the left fork and then if you can't immediately pick up the right fork, you instead put down the left fork and you wait for a random amount of time, all right? Um, so uh, otherwise he put down his fork and pauses for some random amount of time. I might have left and right um, reversed there in what I was saying. But um, this is an example of a random back off strategy, which is like, for example, the old ethernet protocol that, I mean, still used, I believe, um, for like a, a physical single wire ethernet would use something like this. But um, um, the, the key to understanding why this works, it, it does prevent deadlocks um, because, Basically, this this picking up the fork and putting it back down is, in, in my opinion, this is an example of um, of removing the preemption condition. Okay, because basically the way we're describing here is that you pick up one of the forks, so you've actually locked it and you're holding it. So you so you are doing hold and wait, but uh, you haven't used the fork, so you can't really do your work until you have both of the forks to eat. Right in this case. So uh, if you can't immediately get the other fork, uh, you preempt, you unlock. And then you wait for a random amount of time, uh, and then you try again to acquire both locks. Okay, so some people um, uh, talk about this in terms of the three necessary condition and sufficient conditions, the, the four, uh, but identified this as addressing the hold and wait. And technically, I don't think that's quite correct. Um, in order for it to address the hold and wait, you'd have to be saying that uh, every philosopher has to pick up both forks uh, at the same time, and if they can't simultaneously. They back off for a random amount of period. Okay, so you know, it, but that would be equivalent way of stating it. But in that case, uh, the difference is, is that you're trying to make the request simultaneously, and if you don't get the request, um, you know, so, so in that case, you're not actually getting one and holding on to it uh, while you're waiting to see if you can acquire the second one. Uh, you don't allow for hold and wait. You either you have to request all the resources up front, and you either get them or if you don't get them. Um, as was discussed here, you could uh, have it wait for a random amount of time and try again, right? Both of those would give similar um, results, okay? The result is that uh, deadlocks are no longer possible because you have removed one of those necessary conditions. So, so you are gonna be able to prevent deadlocks, but nothing guarantees that starvation won't occur, okay? And I know that it, this is another thing that confuses people because, you know, we're talking about eating here metaphorically, uh, these dying philosophers, but really the dying philosophers is uh, about deadlocks normally, right? But here, it, after we prevent deadlocks, there's nothing, uh, you know, it, it, there would be very unlikely for actual, for starvations to occur. Uh, you'd have to get, uh, since if you are tr using truly random back off here, um, it would be unlikely that one philosopher would keep unluckily being the one that loses out um, for the random a time that it waits and then can't find and finds that it can't get too far. But 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 there's nothing that would prevent that. All right. Um, all right. So yeah, like I said, I didn't really. I, I just wanted to mention a few things about that. Um, so as usual, um, I want to talk about the problem set and then get started on the programming assignment uh, for for this unit here. Um, so let's see here. Um, let me just mention something about question one and three real quickly. Um, and then, um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about four as, as sort of a way of getting into the program assignment. So for the fourth program assignment, we are going to be implementing uh, a page replacement scheme uh, simulation. So, um, so, so this is a good thing to kind of discuss um, uh, as, a, as a starting point for that. But, but let me just mention something about the first problem here. Okay, so if you don't kind of understand um, in the chapter, was it um, seven, uh, our textbook talks about some uh, 
memory management schemes that kind of were precursors to what we would consider modern memory management schemes, so page replacement um, or, or, set, or, or segmentation systems, okay? So before, before that, we had um, what our textbook calls partitioning schemes, uh, dynamic or static partitioning, okay? So in dynamic partitioning, uh, the blocks that can be allocated are of varying size, right? So what happens then is that memory uh, ends up being a sequence of blocks of different sizes, some of them allocated, and then some of them are unallocated or free. Okay, so those are called the free blocks. So a common way for the operating system uh, in a dynamic uh, partitioning scheme to make a decision about uh, which free block to use to fulfill a request um, is to to make um, this. Um, um, the, what's known as a placement decision here, right? And our textbook discusses, actually, I think it only discusses these three, best fit, first fit, next fit, okay? So anyway, for this first question, just think of this as that, you know, um, there, there's blocks of memory, all of different sizes that are currently unused by any process. So that's what's known as the free block list. Um, um, think of this as a linked list, okay? And if it helps, um, you can think of uh, in some concrete number. So maybe there's currently a hundred different blocks, free blocks in memory, uh, all gathered together on a linked list. Okay. So what I'm really, I mean, you should do a discussion, uh, you know, to support your answer, but what I'm looking for is how many of those in, so if n is a hundred to be concrete, how many of those hundred would I have to search in order to uh, implement the best fit placement um, algorithm for dynamic partitioning, right? And same question for first fit and next fit, okay? So this is a little bit like a, a question in data structures, you know, so uh, is the algorithm, I'm looking kind of like a big O, although not exactly like that, but um, um, given the free block list is size in, how much of that needs to be searched for these various placement algorithms, all right? Um, and um, I wanted to say one or two things about question three here. So this is also about um, um, memory management. So here we're imagining uh, a paging system. So, so now instead of our blocks being of different sizes uh, in a paging system, um, which is what modern memory management systems mostly use as some sort of uh, uh, paging um, as the basis for memory management. Uh, what that means is that we, we divide up memory into fixed size pages, okay? So in this case, the page size is one kilobyte, all right? Um, so, and, and you're given that we've actually got four physical frames of memory to work with, okay? So there's only, there's actually only four kilobytes of memory since each page or each physical frame is one kilobyte, all right? So um, the thing you need to understand is it's discussed here in the question as a setup to the things you have to actually answer is, um, so since each page can hold a kilobyte, uh, what we, we wanna load, th these arrays are too big. So, so these arrays um, um, are defined to be two-dimensional, they're, they're 64 by 64, okay? So, so each of these arrays is a 64 rows by 64 column array, uh, A, B, and C. So that means that um, what we have, um, hopefully you can see that, we, we've got uh, actually 4,096, 64 times 64, or we've got 4,096 integers in each of these arrays, all right? Uh, but um, you're given that an integer uh, is four bytes long, right? So of the, the kilobyte, uh, we need four bytes for to hold each integer. So that means that of the kilobyte, with, which is uh, 1,024 bytes, um, we can only hold 256 integers of the total 4,096, all right? So that means that, that each, each of these pages that's one kilobyte long can only hold 256 of the values uh, in the, these two-dimensional arrays, right? Uh, or another way of saying that is that we actually need, so we've got 4,096 integers and we can only get 256 on a page. So that means we each of these um, 
arrays would actually need 16 pages in total, right? So if we had a memory that had three times 16 or 48 pages, we could fit all three of these arrays completely into memory and we wouldn't have to do any demand paging. But we've only got four pages, uh, but you're given that um, we're gonna, one page is assumed to actually have the code that's running. So we can't use one of the pages. So we actually only have three pages to hold um, the data to do the calculation. So what you would want to do is you would want to hold in the page. So if, if I is zero and J is zero, you'd want to load in the page for A that has row zero, column zero, and for B that has row zero, column zero, and C that has row zero, column zero. If you have those three pages, um, in that, that three page working set that, that you have, then you could access, you know, A's row zero, column zero, get that integer, add it to the one um, that's holding B's page, uh, and then save that result back out into the page that's holding the, the results for C, okay? Um, so these questions then are, you know, since I can only hold like 256 integers at a time, at some point um, when you're doing this, you're going to have a reference that this would be what's called a page fault. You're going to have a reference to a value that's uh, no longer the page that you currently have loaded for A, B, and C. And you'd have to load the page you actually need then, replacing the page you have with the one with the value that you need. All right. So that's what's being asked here um, is um, how frequently do page faults occur? Okay? And, you know, if it, it, it's kind of implied, but but yeah, I mean, um, the, the way the code is written, um, it's very inefficient. So there's a there's a way to uh, modify the program to get much less page faults than the program you're originally given. Right. And, and when I ask for frequency, it's, it's best to tell me, like, in total, when the whole program runs, how many page faults occur uh, initially and how many page faults in total occur if you fix it um, and make your modification. All right. Um, so that's all the hints I'll give for that. Um, hopefully that will make sense to people. Um, and then finally, um, you know, I have video lectures about doing the page replacement algorithms. Um, there's discussed in our textbook, uh, I think, what, chapter eight, the, the, the second chapter on virtual memory um, and on uh, the software side of doing memory management, the operating system side of doing memory management. Um, so here, yeah, so, so for this one, you're asked to do LRU and FIFO. Um, I won't uh, kind of repeat those, uh, how to do these. I'll, I'll um, uh, let you watch the videos, but, but oh yeah, in the, on this question, just a couple of notes about this. Uh, you are given that um, this is the, the page reference stream um, and you're given, oh yeah, we've got four pages of, of, of or, or four physical frames of main memory, okay? So, you know, I'll probably usually call that frame zero, our textbook might call it frame one, two, three, four. I'll call that frame zero, frame one, and two, and three. And then we have our page reference stream, one, zero, two, two, one. All right, so I'm, I'm just um, doing this off screen here, but I'll break this over now. So, so for all these, these questions, when you're doing these by hand, um, this is a good representation. So one common thing I have people doing is um, um, sometimes they, they move these around. So for example, uh, they, they might, th these initial, when, when memory is initially empty, we have a reference to, to page one. So it's not in memory. So that's kind of like a page fall. So we have to pick one of these frames to load page one in, right? But then I have people do things like this, uh, kind of like as if they're, as if this is some sort of a stack or, or a circular buffer or something. So they push down page one and load page zero then in frame zero. But, but this is incorrect because basically one thing you're trying to show when you're doing these by hand or when we run these simulations is what actual physical frame the page was loaded into, okay? So it, you would never um, take a page and move it to a different frame because that causes work. You have to actually read the value out of memory uh, and then load it, uh, save it into a new frame in order to move it, shift it, right? So, so that's uh, inefficient. 
Right? So for a paging system, you absolutely need to leave the pages in the frames that, that um, they're loaded in unless you're making a replacement decision to kick out one page and replace it with another. Right. So um, the other thing here is that when memory is initially empty, we're not making replacement decisions. So, so you got to understand the, the difference between the initial placement um, and making replacement decisions. So for, for when memory is empty, you can just pick an empty frame and you should do it the way the textbook does it. Um, um, we, we, we do these in um, um, as if this is a first in, first out, um, and we're using like a frame pointer, right? So, or, or another way to think of that is just pick the first empty frame, okay? So initially memory is empty before our first page reference. So we pick what I call frame zero for the first page reference. And then the second time we still have some frames that are empty and we have another reference to a page. So, so, um, um, so technically this is kind of like a page fault. It's like half a page fault. So since memory was empty, we didn't have to write the values back out, but we did have to read the value from disk uh, into physical frame zero. And, and likewise, we had to read the value. Um, and and, um, and two would be another page fault because you know currently before the reference to page two, we've only got one and zero in memory. So, so now two would get loaded into frame two, which is still empty. So now we actually have a hit, okay? So the first thing you always ask for these um, uh, page replacement decisions is, uh, is the reference a hit or a miss? Only if it's a miss or a fault, do you have to make a possible placement or a replacement decision. For hits, you really don't have to do anything. Um, right? And then, you know, one would be another hit. Oh, so, you know, uh, for uh, whenever you have a hit, memory content shouldn't change. So we've got, page one, zero, and two in our first two frames, we still have an empty frame three here, right? Uh, and again, we have another hit, so nothing changes here. And then um, to finish off the initial placements here, so I'm gonna kind of give you the placement. So, so all of these, no matter whether you're doing FIFO, LRU, clock, um, optimal, the placements will always be the same for these. So if there's an empty frame, you're just, selecting the first empty frame for the initial placements. So we had one zero two two one seven six seven zero here on this problem. All right, so with the reference to seven, we're finally done with the initial placements, okay? So, so seven um, is a fault because it's not in memory and it's gonna get placed in the last um, free frame, right? So then, Really, all the algorithms for the, the replacement algorithms, they don't, you don't have to do anything until you have to make a replacement decision, okay? And you don't make a replacement decision until uh, memory is full. And I have to select a page to kick out to replace with the next one, okay? So that's where, you know, LRU or FIFO comes in. Um, um, just as an example, um, and kind of to set us up then for the program assignment four, uh, maybe I could show a few a few steps of the clock, and then we can calculate the the, the hit ratio, the fault ratio. So I, I also ask you to calculate um, um, the the hit ratio. Okay, so the hit ratio and the fault ratio should be complements of each other, right? So they should have to one. But um, so six would be a page fault because it's not currently in memory, 1027. Um, so if we were doing like clock, for, for clock, you have to know the frame pointer. So for clock, the frame pointer um, is actually back around to frame zero after we did the initial placement. So, so the frame pointer is pointing to frame zero. Uh, we've got page one in there. And yes, I'll have to know the use bits. So uh, whenever you load a page for clock, um, um, you set the use bit initially to one. So I'll just uh, represent that by putting U equals in here to, to remember the use bits. So that would have been the state of our memory, right? So in order to implement clock, you have to know where the frame pointer is, what the use bits are, okay? So the usual thing for clock, unlike FIFO, is you don't select the frame that the frame pointer is pointing to to be replaced. You first have to search for a frame whose use bit is zero 
And then the first frame that you find in G spit is zero, that's the one you select for replacement um, uh, for, uh, for a clock algorithm, right? So um, in this case, and, and then when you're searching, um, you, you skip over the one who's use bits are one, but you set the use bit to zero. So we'd actually end up flipping all these use bits to zero and we'd wrap back around to the top of the buffer and we would end up back on frame zero is the first one we find with the use bit of zero, okay? So what that says is that um, we would replace frame zero. If, if I, I didn't actually do clock, but you might want to you know, do clock for practice and also optimal. You might get those on the, the test four as well. Um, but yeah, we would end up kicking page one out, replacing it with six. Whenever you load a page, you always set the use bit to one, okay? And then the other thing about like FIFO and clock is that the, the page you select for replacement, the frame pointer the, the should be pointing to the next frame after the one you replace. So that's where we're gonna start our search uh, for the next replacement decision is on frame one, right? So now the frame pointer is here on frame one, um, where it has page zero and all the use bits got flipped. Um, right. So now we have this state, right? Um, and then another thing about, so seven is actually hit. So again, always the first thing you ask for replacement decisions is this the reference a hit or a miss? And seven is currently in memory here. Um, so we have a hit. Um, and for a hit for the clock, you do actually do do something. Uh, whenever a hit occurs, you're gonna set the use bit to one. So the use bit for a clock algorithm is uh, uh, one bit of information that gives a, a bit of a hint of how recently the page was referenced. Okay, so if the use bit is one, it means it was probably referenced more recently than something whose use bit was, was set to zero, right? And these get set to zero by, you know, every, every time we scan through these, uh, we flip it from one to zero and skip over replacing it, right? So that approximates um, trying to prefer things that have been used less recently over things that have been used more recently and, and, and kicking out things that have been used less recently here. So, um, so nothing would change except for the use bit. So, so the frame point would still be here. All these use bits would be the same except for the page that just got hit. All right. Uh, and then one more. So we have one more hit here. Um, uh, so because seven is in frame zero, right? Um, so again, the only thing that would happen for that, for a clock algorithm, is that the use bit would get changed. Right? Although that does make a difference now, because now um, um, it, our next fault, we're not going to end up replacing frame one. We're going to skip over it, um, uh, potentially replacing something else whose use bit is still zero. Right? Maybe I'll show one more here just to finish this up, but, um, all right. So yeah, the, the, the next one more page replay, one more page reference um, after zero was um, uh, another reference to one, two, zero. Let's see. Um, so one would be a fault here because we've got currently 6027 in memory. So that would be a fault. So yeah, like, like I was just saying, we're actually gonna skip over uh, frame one, setting its use bit to zero and selecting the first use bit of zero to, for the replacement decision, All right? So, um, so frame page zero and frame one stays there, but its use bit gets flipped to zero as we're scanning. Um, and then we kick out page two and replace it with the reference to page one. The use bit is set to one when we uh, initially load a page. And then our frame pointer is gonna be pointing to the last frame here. All right, and so on. So I just wanted to share that because you do have to implement a clock. Um, um, so you do need to understand this uh, for a programming assignment. Uh, but as a final thing for this assignment, uh, you do need to give the hit ratio. Um, so really the most correct thing to do um, is we really want the hit ratio for when we had to make replacement decisions. Uh, so, so, so you really should ignore 
the initial placements and only look at the replacement decisions, okay? So memory became full at this point. So, so all of these uh, were actually just the initial page placements, right? So, so these don't really tell you the hit or false ratio of our replacement algorithm. They, they, they're, they're telling you the, the hit or false ratio just for initial page placements, right? So if I wanted to calculate the, the page hit ratio uh, after we made the initial you know, placements, when we're actually making replacement decisions, that's only these frames the, these these four memory references here that I just did, right? So in that case, we had two hits out of four references or a hit ratio of two out of four, right? Oops. Um, um, and, and again, you know, hits and faults um, should always be complements, right? So if I'd had one out of four hit ratio, then the fault ratio would have been three out of four, right? But you know, I did ask for the hit ratio, so do give me the hit ratio um, on, on this problem here. All right, so just to summarize that, I mean, you know, do make certain that that you're you're not um, shifting pages. If you do FIFO, um, so I asked, I just asked for two FIFO and um, least recently used. So. Actually, I probably should have had you do FIFO first because FIFO is a little bit easier So, for most people. So, so you should probably get the FIFO done first and then uh, 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 figure out the least recently used replacement. Um, um, but yeah, so, so don't um, actually move pages. Once they get loaded into a frame, you should stay there until it gets replaced by another page um, for, for the replacement decision. Um, and do, I mean, you know, do calculate the hit ratio um, just on the pages that were made where we're, on the references where replacement decisions were made, okay? So, I mean, if you do calculate on all of these, you know, you should really consider, again, you know, if, if it, a load as a fault and hits as hits, right? So, so if I was looking for all of these, um, my hit ratio would be um, one, two, would be four out of the um, um, 10 that I did, right? But you get the most information by just considering hits and faults um, when you're making replacement decisions for these algorithms. All right. Um, so if anybody has any questions, let me know. Uh, but let's go ahead and move on to the assignment, then get started on it for a bit here. So as I already mentioned, um, for the fourth programming assignment, we are going to be implementing a simulation of, um, of uh, page replacement. Um, and uh, so you have to finish up a few things to uh, a few member methods for the general page replacement simulation class. Uh, and then we're also gonna be implementing the clock algorithm, okay? You're, you're given like FIFO, uh, but we're gonna have to finish up the implementation of the clock page replacement. So let me go ahead and do the usual. I'll, I'll accept the assignment. Uh, this assignment, you know, just to let people know, it's probably going to be more like the second one than the third one in terms of the amount of work. So I think there's like eight tasks that you have to do on this one. So um, again, it's going to probably be a little bit longer than, than the one that we just completed up last week. Um, So here I accepted the assignment and I'll go ahead and um, clone the URL to create a local copy of the repository. Put it in my repos directory and um, 
open up that folder once it's cloned, and then reopen it in a dev container and we'll check that everything's compiling. So I make clean, followed by build. So in this assignment, there's probably um, one or two test case. There, there's one test case that's initially um, running. So you will have, should be compiling. It should be running like one test and passing a few assertions. I'll check the um, test runner. Okay, so everything's working. Um, and um, I'll go ahead and create the first issue here. Um, I might have mentioned this in a previous video, but um, I'm um, I'm not really taking off points, but I do encourage you to, you know, create the issues um, and uh, associate them with the pull request just as kind of practice for pretty standard procedures, the way that most projects that are using like Git or using uh, GitHub or using other kinds of repositories like this usually use the issue tracking system to create work and then uh, um, associate that with um, like a, a pull request uh, to keep track of what issues were uh, done on that pull request and all that kind of good stuff. So. All right, so there we've got task one. So let's let's talk about the assignment. Um, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure here um, um, of of the the files in here. So uh, this is a little bit more com complicated um, design here than what we've had before for the previous assignments. Uh, and in fact, um, if you've never run across what are known as design patterns. You might want to kind of read the wikis on these things. But we're using kind of a, a strategy design pattern here. Um, so um, um, should have drawn out some UML here. But um, basically, if we look at the, the files that we have, here, let's look at the include files. Um, the the class called paging system, that's the one that's really the simulation of the paging system. So, so this is kind of the, the, the main class uh, that, that implements and runs the simulation of a, of a paging system, a demand paging system, basically. Um, and you have to finish a few things in here. But um, we use... Um, what we call a page replacement scheme to make the actual replacement decisions. Okay, so, so this is these page replacement schemes actually implement um, a page replacement strategy, right? So maybe a better name for this would have been page replacement strategy. And then uh, in particular, um, if you look at these, so there is a page replacement scheme.hpp. This is really just an, what's known as an abstract base class. So this, this actually defines an interface so that all of these page replacement schemes or strategies um, are going to use object-oriented inheritance. So they're going to be ch child classes of this class. Um, since all these are virtual functions, though, uh, any class that uh, wants to be a concrete implementation of a page replacement scheme has to implement these four methods. Um, so has to be able to reset the scheme, has to respond to if a page hit occurs, um, get the scheme status, and then the big one, those make the replacement decision, right? So all these schemes, basically the um, paging system doesn't make the replacement decision. It's going to ask a strategy or a scheme to make the replacement decision. Uh, and this returns back the frame number that's selected for replacement by the, 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 the scheme that's implemented, right? Um, so, for example, uh, you're already given um, FIFO 
first in, first out. So notice if you look at the, the FIFO page replacement scheme um, dot HPP here, you'll see that it inherits, it inherits publicly from the base class page replacement scheme. Uh, and then basically it implements, besides a constructor, it implements those four methods, right? So these are no longer virtual methods. These are concrete implementations. Um, so for example, to implement FIFO, all you need is a frame pointer, right? Um, so if we look at the, the FIFO page replacement, um, what it does when it's first constructed um, is it just sets the frame pointer to be pointing to frame zero initially. Uh, when we have, um, so that's that's going to be the frame um, that gets selected for replacement by the first in first out uh, scheme or strategy for page replacement, right? And then all it does, if it's asked to make a replacement decision, um, is um, whatever the frame pointer is pointing to, it returns that as the frame to be replaced. And, but it, uh, before it returns that, it increments the frame pointer by one uh, in anticipation of the next request to make a replacement decision. Although, you know, again, FIFO always treats the buffer as a circular buffer. So it increments by one, but it um, um, uh, oh, this is something you actually have to fix um, um, in the assignment here. It, 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 you have to actually mod by the number of frames in order to wrap it back around to frame zero, right? So you can use, either use an if statement or um, use the, the modulus operator, but um, I'll talk about that later. But, but yeah, you have to actually get the memory size, um, which is the, the number of physical frames that's being simulated um, by the, the paging system uh, to do this step correctly here. So. Um, all right, so yeah, I mean, that, that, that was just kind of all kind of background. So that, that's the scheme. And um, 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 so that means that every paging system is gonna be created with uh, some scheme, but, but you know, because of the strategy design pattern, the scheme that the, can be a concrete, you know, can be a FIFO page replacement scheme that we create. So we can simulate doing FIFO page replacement, or it can be a clock, or you know, we could we could also implement LRU uh, or any of the other page replacement schemes, right? Um, so, but yeah, depending on the scheme object that we create, it'll be doing that type of page replacement in the simulation. Um, and likewise, so this is kind of a pointer to the strategy, and whenever it needs to make a replacement decision, it'll it'll send a message to, the, to that strategy or scheme uh, asking for the you know, which page should be replaced. Likewise, though, for like, um, um, if I look at the page replacement scheme here, the, the our page replacement schemes also have a pointer back to the paging system uh, that they're a, a strategy for, right? So if they need to ask information about the, the, the larger simulation, they can use the sys pointer, like for example, to get the, the current simulated memory size or number of physical frames, that kind of stuff. So, so both of these classes have pointers to each other so that they can um, um, work with each other to do the work of the simulation. So. Um, all right, so anyway, the, the first four tasks, I think, um, we're going to be finishing. So there was uh, first five tasks. And the first five tasks, uh, there's a few things that were left undone in the basic um, paging system simulation. And then after that, uh, the last task, six through nine, is to actually implement the clock paging system, which is, which, you know, FIFO was given to you, but we have to uh, implement a full working version of clock page replacement, right? Um, I'll probably talk more about that um, on Wednesday um, in a little bit more detail. So let's get started on the task as usual here. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about um, on these. So the first one is, is again, meant to be kind of a warm up. Um, uh, you do have to implement like uh, three getter methods, um, but like in previous assignments, these are mostly just returning back the indicated member variable, the memory size, the system time, and the, the non-page references, okay? Um, oops. 
so if we look at our tests here, I, I think I did, yeah, we did break this up into three subtasks. So you, you probably should go ahead and do these one by one. Um, so like uh, subtask one of task one um, is just seeing if, if you get the, if you implement the get memory size, right? So get memory size, if we create a simulation that has five physical frames of memory, um, and we ask for the memory size that's being simulated, you should return back the value that the number of frames was initialized with, okay? Um, I think unlike on the previous assignment, this is probably initialized correctly for you. So if we look at the, um, the um, paging system.cpp, let me close off some of these here until we need them again. Um, So if we look at the implementation of the paging system for the constructor, um, you notice that we pass in the memory size and it initializes the memory size variable um, uh, to that that's in the indicated there. So, um, oh, um, just to kind of discuss this, if this isn't clear, um, the default constructor, well, the, the, the basic constructor for the paging system actually takes two parameters, but in the test, you'll see that uh, we're only specifying one, the memory size. Uh, that's because um, we use what's known as a default parameter here. So by, by default, if you don't specify the second parameter, it defaults to using FIFO page replacement scheme, right? So, so that's how we're by default always, always using FIFO in our test. So unless otherwise specified, like you want clock or LRU, um, it'll default to FIFO, right? So by not specifying the second parameter, um, you'll get FIFO as a default and here is where we basically figure out, you know, so based on this enumerated type, we create a new instance of either a FIFO page replacement scheme or a clock page replacement scheme um, and save that as the scheme member variable that I already talked about um, uh, here. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, anyway, so to pass this first test though, uh, you do have to implement the get memory size. Um, I did not give you the um, the signature for these, nor the function documentation. So you do you have to create the, the correct signature, uh, add the function implementation, uh, and you are required to have your function documentation. You should always add in the function documentation when you first create the function. So don't do that as like an afterthought, you know. So don't implement the functions and commit those, and then at a later commit uh, create the the documentation for the functions. So. Um, so hopefully I, I described this in the uh, issue or in the assignment description. So, you know, get memory size just returns an int. So most accessor methods aren't going to take any parameters as input and they're just going to return a value of, of the appropriate type. And most accessor methods that are getters uh, aren't actually going to modify any you know member variables or modify the state of the class, so they should usually be constant member functions, um, kind of like I did here. So oh um, you know as usual, if I declare that, that should be enough to actually compile because now that we've declared the signature for get memory size in the header function. Uh, the compiler kind of knows how to compile our assignment for tests. Um, but, you know, if, since we haven't done the implementation yet, um, it's going to um, complain when it tries to link everything together that, that somebody's trying to reference that is trying to actually call the implementation of get memory size and, and we don't have that actually implemented anywhere. So, um, So, so I'll go ahead and put these getter methods right before the page stream to string. Um, and this is a implement 
this is a member method of the paging system. So when we put in the implementation file here, the .cpp file, we have to specify that this is a member method of the paging system here. Um, this is just kind of a side, but you know, you should you should try to keep the order that these are declared in the header file to be the same order that you find them in the implementation file. So again, that's kind of class style, although I usually kind of don't really check that, but um, um, that usually makes the most sense for people. Uh, that, that'll be the style that you normally see in projects that, you know, if you're doing a header file, uh, if you've got some particular order that these are declared, um, they should end up kind of in the same order when they're implemented over in your implementation file. So, you know, make certain your documentation always has um, a brief title, which should be, you know, a couple word, like think of it as like a title um, that will appear in the documentation. Then you should have a longer description, which is a sentence, at least a sentence or more. Um, and then you should always document all parameters. We don't have any, but if you have any parameters, you have an at param tag, and then also document all return values. Um, so we do have a return value that returns the end here. So here, you know, just as an example, you know, and again, um, as long as you're fulfilling these, I'm, I'm mostly going to be fine. Although, you know, I, I do this more for practice for people that maybe have never done stuff like this, you know, so try to get, make good habits. So this should be, you should use full English sentences for this, the just descriptions whenever you're doing these. There should be a title, um, although here it's, um, it's, uh, Um, it, it's just getting the uh, to getter method that's getting the, the simulations memory size. Um, so um, here we can do something like um, um, say uh, so. The description is that uh, the getter method uh, returns the the size of physical memory uh, for this uh, simulation. Uh, e.g. the number of physical frames of memory being simulated by this paging system, right? Uh, and then, you know, uh, 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 Continued lines, you should indent an additional two spaces. So, um, so returns the number of physical frames of memory being simulated by this paging system. All right. And then, so for all three of these, you're basically just going to be returning the um, corresponding um, uh, member variable. All right, so that should be enough to get this to compile and, and uh, pass the tests, right? I'll go and do a clean build again. All right, so now we've got two test case um, uncommon is passing the, uh, the tests in the two test case here. Um, all right, and then, yeah, I'm probably not gonna show any more of these here today. I'll just discuss the rest of the tasks. So, you know, the, the remaining for task one is to also implement the, get this, getting the system time. So like in previous um, simulations, we have to keep track of system time <laughs> and it starts off at zero. So it should be initialized for you, you just need to return the system time. Um, and return the number of page references. Okay, so the input files, I didn't show those yet, but uh, the input files are, are relatively simple for this simulation. Um, they're just, um, a each line has a page reference. Okay, so the first line is the, the total number of page references uh, for simulation one. This should be the same set of references that's in our textbook for the examples for the page, page replacement decision. Okay, but yeah, the the, the page that was referenced at time zero was, was a reference to page two. 
And then at time one, we had a reference to page three, to time two, three, four, five, right? So time goes from zero to that. And then also this is the number of page references. So um, if you load um, page reference, uh, one simulation file has 12 page references, page reference two simulation file has 30 and so on, right? Um, Okay, and then let me just describe uh, these last uh, few things. And, and like I said, um, I probably won't go into a lot of description about the clock page replacement. Uh, I'll leave that for uh, Wednesday, um, this, just to get you going. But you have to implement a couple of methods, right? So uh, the first one to implement is the is memory full method, right? So if you look at the signature of is memory full, so we, we can look at the, the test for task two here. Um, Basically, is memory full doesn't take any parameters as input and it returns a boolean result of true or false, right? So, um, um, so here we're simulating a system that has seven physical frames of memory, and we just poked in some values to memory to the first um, four frames, right? But in that case, the, the the last three frames were actually empty, so we use zero to mean an empty frame. So only only pages one or greater. Or valid page numbers in the simulation here. So actually, memory is not full here, so it should return a false if you ask, is memory full? Uh, but then if we if we uh, fill up those uh, last em three empty frames with, with three pages, valid pages, uh, then at that point it should return true that memory is full, right? So I think for all of these, um, I basically kind of gave pseudocode usually. So uh, the easiest way to check to implement is memory full is to look at each physical uh, frame, right? And if you find a frame that's empty, you return false immediately. But if you check all of them and they're all not empty, so to get past that loop, um, you just want to return true. Um, you, you've determined that memory is full. Right? So the way to check these is that um, You need to use some member variables for these. So basically, you know, you already use the memory size. That's the number of physical frames. So that's how many times you have to do your loop, right? So if memory size is five, that means that we've dynamically allocated an array called memory um, to hold the, the pages. And that gets initialized to empty page, which is defined as zero or empty frame, which is defined as zero there, right? Um, but yeah, so, so but, after this, you can think of this just as a regular array of, of page numbers or of integers. So you can search through this. Um, and if you find one that's an empty frame, return false. And if, if none of them are empty, you return true. Right. Um, and again, you know, I mentioned this on the previous assignment, don't use magic numbers. So you should be using like this defined uh, global constant empty frame uh, instead of comparing if the frame is zero, comparing it if it's an empty frame, that kind of stuff. Um, all right, so task three then is to implement the is page hit. So remember, so when I was walking through these uh, in my lecture videos or just now for this help session, uh, the very first thing you always do for these simulations is, is you have to check if the, pa the, the page at the current time, if it's a hit or a fault. Um, all right, and depending on that, 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 will, that will tell you what you need to do to handle that page reference. So you don't have to do much for a page hit. If it's a page fault though, you might have to make a placement or a replacement decision. Um, so the signature for is page hit is the same as like for is memory full. So it doesn't take any parameters as input and it returns a Boolean result, uh, false or true. Right. So to do this one, uh, you have to know, you have to be able to access memory like you did for the is memory full, but you also have to additionally be able to access what the current system time is and um, what what page is being referenced. All right. So so to implement this task now, you not only have to use the um, um, memory size and the um, array of memory. So you're going to be searching that, but there's another array called page reference 
which, you know, the, the page reference, if the current system time is zero and you can access that from the system time member variable, um, the, the page reference array at index zero will have the page that's referenced at time zero, right? Or like I showed here, if the system time is zero, the page being referenced is page two. That'll be load, loaded to um, index zero of the page referencing. And this will be at index one, two, three, and, and so on. Right. So, you, so you need to use all, all of those for is um, the page a hit or not, right? So you're basically going to be searching through memory um, um, to see if you find that page that's referenced at the current system time in memory, all right? Um, so, so, um, so yeah, so here's kind of pseudocode for that. So. For each frame, uh, so, so again, you might want to have a loop the same like you had before, uh, look at each physical frame of memory, and if, but in this case, you're not looking if the frame is empty, you're looking if that frame holds the, the current page that's referenced. So if you find that that the current page at the current system time um, is in that memory frame, just return true. But if you search through all those and you fail to find the current page that's referenced, you want to return false. Um, it's, a, it's not a page hit, it was a page fault. Right. Um, and then the final thing I ask you to do, um, um, depending on, so if it is a page fault, uh, um, what needs to be done is that if memory is not full, we do a page placement. But if memory is full, we do a page replacement, okay? Um, so, um, just as an aside, you can kind of see how that works. So if, if you look at the um, the main loop for the, the paging system simulation, um, uh, there's a function called process next page reference. All right. So if you look at that, um, process next page reference. Uh, oh, there's a bunch of stuff commented out. So um, um, that leads me to, I wanted to talk about this here. So kind of the, the first thing you should do for task four um, is um, like it's described here, um, is um, uncomment the stuff in process next page reference. Let's go ahead and do that. Yeah. So, so really, I mean, all the work is commented out because it relies on the implementation of the is page hit that you just did and the is memory full that you did on the task before that, right? So the basic thing for every, you know, so this, this process is each page reference um, uh, one by one. So for the current page reference, we first ask if it's a hit or not. If it's a hit, we don't do it. If it's a hit, we just tell the, the strategy or the scheme. We, we inform it that a page hit occurred. If it's a miss, then the question is if memory is full, we need to make a replacement decision, right? Um, and um, you don't have to implement that. That was given to you. I'll go and look at that one. Um, but if, if memory is not full, then we're doing an initial page placement. Okay, so that's what you're actually implementing on task four here. So to implement, um, um, oh, I, I did ask you to throw an exception. So you really should never, do page placement should never be able to be called if memory is full, but um, um, you, you can look. So the do page replacement does the same thing, but it checks if memory is not full. Um, but, but yeah, so you should just check if, if memory is full, you should throw an exception. Otherwise, you're basically just going to search for the first um, empty frame and then um, um, so, so you search through all of the frames of memory. As soon as you find, I mean, you should be guaranteed that there's at least one empty frame. So as soon as you come across the first empty frame, then you place the current uh, page that's being referenced into that empty frame, right? And then you should return immediately. So it's a common bug that people uh, don't return or don't break out of this loop, and they end up replacing all the empty frames with that page that's currently referenced, right? But that's an easy thing to spot that you're doing that uh, incorrectly. You'll your test will fail um, immediately um, if you're doing that. So. Um, um, if you're curious, I mean, you should take a look at the do page replacement, all right? So here's how do page replacement works. Oh, and you do have to uncomment some of this for the, the task five, the next one after you do task four here. Um, 
but here's all do page replacement is doing. So it's kind of like you need to do for do page placement. It, it is also doing kind of a sanity check. But in this case, you should never call a page replacement if memory is not full. So if there's an empty frame, you should be doing uh, just a, a simple page placement instead of a replacement, right? But this function is, is made very simple because we're not actually implementing the page replacement decision, we're using the strategy, um, all right? So um, um, I actually call another function called make replacement decision, which I'm not certain I really needed to separate that into a separate function, but, but make replacement decision basically calls the strategies make replacement decision to figure out the frame to replace. Um, and that, that whatever the, the replacement strategy um, or scheme tells us as the frame to replace, that's the one that we place. Um, and, and also here's an example of kind of what you need to do when you find an empty frame, you have to access the current page this reference and replace that empty frame. Uh, but here for making a replacement decision, our, our replacement scheme or strategy tells us what frame to replace and we just kick that page out uh, and replace it with the current page this reference, all right? So anyway, that, that was your task four. And then for task five, there are a couple of, of things because basically um, um, parts of the simu full simulation need to use the things that you implemented, the two do page placement, the is page hit and the is memory full and the get memory size. Um, so, um, um, so there is a place in get page status that you have to uncomment the call to is page hit and is memory full. So, you know, if you look at the get page status, uh, you'll see that uh, you need to uncomment these things when you get to task five. Um, and um, we already enabled in the do page placement, right? But um, the, the do page placement has to have um, I'm sorry, the, the, the process next page reference um, has to have those um, commented out like I already did here. Um, and then the do page placement um, um, has one more thing. Uh, and I commented that out. I mean, I uncommented that as well because um, it's using the is memory full. So, you know, um, on step five, you should uncomment that. So it, it's... Um, checking that um, and, and throwing an exception if it's ever called, if there's still some empty frames in memory. Uh, but then there are two more things that need to be done over in the FIFO page replacement scheme. Uh, one thing in get scheme status and one in the make replacement de decision, okay? So um, if you look at the FIFO page replacement scheme uh, implementation, In get scheme status, um, there's a loop that goes all of all the frames, but um, it, it actually doesn't execute the way the code is given. It goes, starts at frame zero, but stops if, if um, um, frame is less than zero here. Um, anyway, um, but this actually needs to execute um, depending on the memory size, okay? So like I show here, I mean, I, I didn't, I, I gave it to you. I mean, you just really have to change that line to, to be calling the paging system. You know, it, it needs that get memory size getter method that you implemented um, on your first task in order to figure out how to iterate, how many frames of physical memory there are to iterate over, all right? Uh, likewise, I already mentioned this, but also in the make replacement decision, um, we need to also get the memory size uh, in order to correctly wrap around the buffer, right? So um, if you replace that that line uh, by that, it will get the memory size and correctly wrap the buffer around when it increments the frame point, all right? Like, like I said, I'm gonna wrap up here, but once you do those, you should be getting all of your tests, unit tests to pass. Um, for, um, well, uh, uh, for using the basic FIFO page replacement and also actually the system tests that test FIFO should be passing at this point as well. But um, um, we have some further steps. So the, the last four tasks are to implement 
those four methods of the um, clock page replacement. Okay, and these are going to be similar. So you can start by using the FIFO implementation. You just you just have to add a little bit of extra work uh, to implement uh, the reset scheme, uh, the page hit, and the make replacement decision, um, and the get scheme status um, for a clock scheme. All right. Um, all right, so yeah, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the session here. So that's plan for today. Hopefully, I'll let you guys get started. Um, as usual, if you have questions, uh, keep emailing them. Um, I'm, I've mentioned this before, but go ahead and if it's a question about the assignments, especially the programming assignments, keep, put both me and the, the class GA on your email. That way, you know, um, whoever of us checks the email first uh, can get you the help um, kind of fastest or re re respond to your question um, uh, faster. So. Um, all right, so that's in, it for the session. I'll go ahead and post this and I'll see you guys later then.